Hey, thank you everyone so much for coming along to this latest IIT theoretical seminar. Um, we're very grateful today that Tanya Roberts, uh, Tanya Rogers, sorry, um, is going to come and present us on chaos, intermittent instability, and in ecological systems. Uh, so, without further ado, Tanya, please, thank you. Hey, thank you for the invitation to speak in this theory session. Even though I'm not much of a theoretician, and there isn't much theory in this talk, but hopefully it will provide some interesting food for thought. So I'll be presenting on a couple of projects that I worked on with Steve Munch as a postdoc, and then later after I got a job at the same place that Steve works. So uh, we have continued collaborating on this and other, other projects. Uh, my other co-authors include Bethany Johnson, who uh, was a PhD student at uh, UC Santa Cruz and applied math, and she now teaches at um, Humboldt State, and also Celia Simmons, who's at UC Irvine. So when it comes to understanding population fluctuations in ecology, there have historically been two main explanations, which are environmental drivers and population dynamics in the form of density dependence or species interactions known to lead to either a stable equilibrium or regular cycles. And thus, when we encounter irregular population fluctuations or cycles, the thought was that this must be the result of the environment or other random influences that are fundamentally unpredictable. Another possibility arose with the discovery of chaos, which was first introduced to ecology by Bob May in the 70s, where in discrete uh, models of logistic population growth found that um, slight differences in initial population sizes these two trajectories that initially track one another, but then begin to diverge, displaying the char characteristics of chaos, which are sensitivity to initial conditions, uh, the bounded irregular deterministic oscillations, the lack of sta stable equilibria or fixed points, and short-term but not long-term predictability. And so this generated a bunch of interest into whether chaos could explain some of the irregular fluctuations that we see in nature. Uh, since then, numerous theoretical and empirical studies have been done, and we know a lot more about chaos now than we did in the 1970s. So moving beyond the logistic map, we know that chaos is more likely in more complex uh, higher dimensional systems, that is systems with multiple species or age classes, life histories, populations in space, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, in this... Um, simulated multi-species Bricker random predator random predator to prey networks, uh, we can see that the probability of chaos increases as the number of species goes up. We also know that chaos doesn't necessarily depend on or require high growth rates, nor does it necessarily lead to drops to low population sizes and higher extinction risk. We also know that chaotic and non-chaotic time series, although they're very different from the standpoint of modeling and predictability, it can be impossible to distinguish visually. We also know that chaos is harder to detect in short, noisy time series, such as those we get in ecology. And so many researchers have, wor have worked on developing methods to detect chaos in empirical data in cases where we don't necessarily know the underlying model. What a lot of these methods attempt to do is to estimate a quantity called the Lyapunov exponent, specifically the dominant Lyapunov exponent, which I'll just be calling the LE, which is the exponential divergence rate of trajectories averaged across an entire trajectory with positive values being indicative of chaos. So much in the same way, the Jacobian matrix tells you whether trajectories will diverge or converge depending on whether the log dominant eigenvalue is positive or negative. The Lyapunov exponent expresses whether this is true across the whole trajectory, thus capturing sensitivity to initial conditions. And so when the LE is positive, its magnitude is indicative of the forecast horizon, which is about equal to its inverse. And there are several different methods that exist for estimating the LE. OK, so given all of this, what do we know about the prevalence of chaos in ecology? So it may surprise you to hear that the most recent global meta-analysis found that only one out of 634 ecological time series was chaotic. This is by Sibley et al. 2007. Uh, thus concluding it is unlikely that chaotic dynamics occur in natural populations. Similar conclusions have been drawn by a variety of other recent 
papers that have analyzed empirical time series. And there seems to be a consensus in the field that chaos in ecology is quote unquote rare. As if to exemplify this, this is these are results from a literature review we worked on about all publications about chaos in ecology published in ecology and general science journals, which is the top panel. Uh, so the bars are the number of publications and then the purple line is the number of publication as a, as, publications as a proportion of the total number of publications published that year in these fields. So uh, as you can kind of see, the interest in chaos in ecology really peaked in the mid 1990s and has been on kind of a steady decline ever since then. Meanwhile, uh, the use of ecological models in journals specifically about chaos has been kind of on a steady increase. So while people who study chaos still, still seem to think ecology is relevant, Fewer people who study ecology seem to think that chaos is relevant, which is a bit surprising. Uh, so, and this whole idea that chaos is rare may strike you as a bit odd because why should chaos in ecology be rare given the nonlinear dynamics, which are a necessary condition for chaos are, are everywhere. Uh, we just saw that ecosystems are, well, we know the ecosystems, ecosystems are highly complex and high dimensional, which we know promotes chaos. And we know that abiotic drivers of ecosystems, which we know are important, are themselves chaotic. For instance, the quintessential chaotic system known as the weather. Moreover, there have been several robust experimental and field demonstrations of chaos in these variety of well-studied systems. So is it just that chaos, chaos is impossible to, to, to detect in field data if it's there, or is it just something about the methods that we're using to look for it? So I should mention that most of these meta-analyses that conclude that chaos is rare do so by fitting one-dimensional parametric models and then inferring chaos based on whether the parameter estimates for those models would produce chaos in that model, which is a totally reasonable thing to do if you don't have a lot of data and given that some models, some 1D models like the logistic and worker maps can produce chaos. But these one-dimensional models, by which I mean uh, the next state is only a function of the previous state, uh, they treat all higher dimensional dynamics like species interactions or A structure as noise. Uh, for example, say we had this data set here, we have um, uh, future abundance and current abundance. You might reasonably look at this, decide to fit the beverton holt model and conclude that the dynamics are stable, although somewhat noisy. So these data really were generated from a chaotic two-dimensional predator-prey system with no noise at all. And so what is actually deterministic chaos in two dimensions looks like stable dynamics with noise in one dimension. And so sometimes using a model with lower dimension can be misleading. And so what these other meta-analyses are really testing is whether low dimensional chaos like that seen in the original logistic map can explain population fluctuations? The answer there is clearly no, but what these methods can't tell us is anything about uh, the presence of higher, higher dimensional chaotic dynamics. In fact, the last meta-analysis to use flexible higher dimensional methods was published uh, over 25 years ago now by Elner and Turchin in 1995. And this found evidence for chaos in 23% of field time series and 15% of experimental time series, uh, stressing that their procedure was biased against finding chaos and thus a strong indication that ecological systems are capable of chaotic behavior. Although surprisingly, many in the field still cite this paper as evidence that chaos is rare, having clearly not read the discussion. So now that we have more data and new and improved methods, why nobody has bothered to repeat this study it was kind of surprising. So that's what we set out to do in, in our study here. So in our analysis had two parts. So the first was to test how well various chaos detection methods work under ecologically realistic conditions, that is short and noisy data. We specifically used non-parametric higher dimensional methods designed to operate on a single time series by substituting lags for unobserved dimensions. And then we tested what happens if we apply these best methods to empirical data from a large number of species around the world. Uh, these were the six chaos detection methods that we tested. So there were two methods for estimating Lyapunov exponents and then four other algorithms. 
to provide a little more detail about how these work. So the direct method for estimating LE is this uh, for each time point in the time series finds its nearest neighbor in state space. In this case, it's delay coordinate space and measures the distance between them as uh, time goes forward. And you can make a plot of the average log divergence across all time points versus time number of time steps into the future. And the slope of this linear part is the open of exponent. The Jacobi method for estimating LEs is a little more involved. So this involves fitting a delay embedding map. So estimating this function F and then from the fitted surface, taking the partial derivatives at each time point to use it to construct a local Jacobian matrix for each time point. And then we multiply all those Jacobian matrices together and the LE is the average log dominant eigenvalue of the sequential Jacobian product. And as I was explaining before, this expresses the average divergence rate between uh, arbitrarily close points. The recurrence quantification analysis that involves constructing this recurrence matrix for a time series. So that expresses which time points are close to which other time points in delay coordinate space. And these are examples of recurrence matrices for a stochastic uh, chaotic and periodic system. And then we can use properties of the distribution of diagonal segment lengths to differentiate between chaotic and non-chaotic series. The permutation entropy method, this involves uh, computing the rank order of points, the permutation of the points for all, all subsets of a time series of a given length and then computing the Shannon entropy of the distribution of permutations as a way to differentiate chaotic and non-chaotic ser chaotic series. Uh, the other two methods, I don't have little cute diagrams for, but uh, as you'll see later, they didn't actually do that well. So I won't be talking too much about them, but you, you're welcome to ask me about them later. Uh, so for our simulation testing, we developed a fairly large training data set with several stochastic, periodic, and chaotic models, each of which had different levels of observation noise and time series length. And we use these for optimizing the methods and for some initial testing. And then we applied the methods unmodified to two different validation data sets, which use a different set of stochastic, periodic, and chaotic models, um, and some of which had both process observation noise and process noise. Uh, we did 100 replicates for every single of these combinations and in total there were 37 different models that we tried. And we found that three of the methods were effective classifiers. These were the Jacobian LE method, uh, recurrence quantification analysis and permutation entropy. Uh, the direct method for estimating LEs is not able to differentiate between noise and chaos, so it had a high false positive rate. The other two had high false negative rates. Uh, the best performing method was the Jacobian method. Uh, we found that performance was similar on both the test and validation data sets, which is reassuring. Uh, op noise, observation and process noise, acted to increase the false negative rate, but it did not really impact the false positive rate. And the Jacobian method had the best performance of all the methods at short time series lengths. Okay, so moving on to empirical data. So we then apply these three different methods to 172 time series from the Global Population Dynamics Database, or the GPDD. And this is a subset of the GPDD where we had a reasonable chance of actually detecting chaos if it was there. So these all had at least 30 time points and some constraints on the number of zeros and missing values. And we found that uh, at least a third of the time series were classified as chaotic. So the Jacobian method gave 33%, the others uh, produced somewhat higher percentages. So that was pretty interesting. Also chaos prevalence seemed to vary by taxonomic group. So plankton had the highest percentage of time series that were chaotic. Birds and mammals had the least and insects and fishes were somewhere in the middle. And these are the results using the Jacobian method, which are all of the results I'll be presenting on the subsequent slides since that was the most reliable of the methods. So this is 
pretty interesting and def definitely does not suggest that chaos is rare. And so one question is, you know, why do these results differ so much from those of other meta-analyses? So we did some tests and we were able to determine that restricting dimensionality does indeed reduce our ability to detect chaos. So if we were to constrain the delay embedding model used by the Jacobian method to an E of one, so essentially just fitting a 1D non-parametric model, uh, this reduces the apparent prevalence of chaos from 33% to less than 10%. And these effects are seen across all taxonomic groups. Uh, if we use some commonly used one-dimensional parametric models and fit those and compute the LE analogously, this further reduces um, the apparent prevalence of chaos. So dimensionality clearly matters here. Going back to our main results, we found that chaos was more prevalent in shorter lived species. So which possibly explains some of the taxonomic results we found. So uh, these plots here show how the proportion of series that were chaotic and the value of the Lyapunov exponent tend to be higher in species with shorter generation times. There are a variety of possible explanations for this. It could be because longer lived species maybe are better insulated from a chaotic environment. Longer lived species also have lower average mortality rates. So potentially weaker interactions with other species per unit time. Longer lived species also have, may just have fewer generations sampled. So, and since detection depends on time series length relative to the intrinsic time scale, they may just be less likely, less likely to detect chaos in them. Uh, another thing we looked at was the relationship between the value of positive LEs and body size. So for this, we combined our results, which are the points in blue, uh, with some independently estimated LEs from laboratory and field studies that were compiled by Anderson and Galili. And those are the points in red. And these included some microbial species so we could span a larger range of body sizes. And we found that there seems to be a consistent relationship of uh, scaling about minus one six. Also, when we went and computed some additional LEs from some lake zooplankton, which are the points in yellow, which were not used to fit the line, they actually do fall nicely along this relationship. So this is pretty interesting. We're not entirely sure why we see this pattern, but we have some ideas and think it's maybe worth following up on. So I guess at this point, that's all pretty interesting. But if you're like some of our reviewers and are wondering, well, what is this? Are you measuring, is it really chaos or couldn't it just be noise kind of masquerading as chaos? And at this point, I'll remind you that noise increases in our simulations, at least increases the false negative rate. It doesn't increase the false positive rate. So noise can hide chaos, but it doesn't necessarily cause it to appear where it's not there. Also in our in the GPDD, we found that series classified as chaotic were indeed more variable than series classified as non-chaotic, but they were not they were not necessarily less predictable than series classified as non-chaotic. Uh, so which you might expect if noise is really just or chaos is really just noise, you'd have less predictability. Also, the consistent scaling or scaling with mass. With the low with uh, the laboratory studies, which have essentially no noise at all, suggests we are measuring something that's a real pattern. Oh, but what about non-stationarity? Is it really chaos? Or are you just measuring exponential growth, which would also have a positively optimal exponent? Uh, so, in this case, the median growth rates of times in the time series did not differ between chaotic and non-chaotic classified series, both of which were around zero. Most of the chaotic series do not have a monotonic trend in our study. Uh, upon further inspection, there we did find a few cases of what is probably exponential growth being misclassified as chaos. We can reclassify those as non-chaotic if you want. It doesn't really change the percentages that much because it's only a small number. And they're mostly birds and mammals. Oh, but is it really chaos or is it just the chaotic induction of marine plankton and we're just measuring chaotic water movements and not actually population dynamics? So in this case, that's kind of why we did our additional analysis of lake zooplankton, which are arguably less influenced by infection than marine plankton. And in this case, 47% of those were classified as chaotic. So 
somewhat lower, but still, you know, not rare. Uh, we also see if you look at the time series for the plankton, marine plankton, like this one plotted here, they show pretty persistent seasonal peaks and troughs in abundance that are probably more, I would guess, are more likely due to seasonal, seasonal population blooms than to water movement and infection. And also the consistent mass scaling that we see is unlikely to have been the result of infection. So, uh, all right. Now having hopefully convinced you that chaos is not rare, I'm gonna move on to part two, which is a follow-up study we did on intermittent instability. All right, so we've been talking so far about the Oppenov exponents, which express stability and divergence across an entire time series. Uh, so this series, for example, had positive LE. Uh, but we can also measure or quantify whether the dynamics are diverging or converging at any particular point in time as expressed, for instance, by the eigenvalues of the local Jacobian matrix. So this series, for example, um, most of the local stability eigenvalues are positive, but they do seem to fluctuate between periods of locally stable and unstable dynamics. So one thing we were curious about is how widespread this time varying local stability is and what these patterns might be related to. And this time varying local stability has been documented in a couple other studies. So Ben and Ka et al, for example, in this New Zealand Rocky Shore system found a Lyapunov exponent that was statistically indistinguishable from zero, but that the local Lyapunov exponents fluctuated over time uh, between positive and negative values. Uh, likewise, this uh, Ushio et al, in fact, looking at a Japanese fish community, um, was they I believe they looked at eigenvalues and they found that they oscillated between also oscillated between stable and unstable periods. But these are just two systems; they're both relatively open, um, and so we were wanted to know if there's anything more general we can say about this phenomenon. So to do that, we assembled monthly plankton time series plankton, because as we've seen, plankton are prone to chaos from uh, 17 different lakes in four different marine locations. So that was 154 species level time series. We use the Jacobian method to compute both the LEs and measures of local stability. And then we assessed, uh, well, we assessed the prevalence of chaos as well as seasonal fluctuations in local stability. Uh, whether there's any relationship between local stability and predictability, um, or there's any across-site patterns in LEs or seasonality of local stability. And we assessed how all these results are affected by the level of data aggregation. So whether we're looking at you know, species level time series or aggregated to functional groups or aggregated to trophic levels. And so we did find that lo <clears throat> local stability does sometimes oscillate, but there's a range of different behaviors you can get. So in this species, for example, we have plots of abundance by month and the lines connect points from the same year. And in the, the middle panel is local stability by month. And then the right panel is the power spectrum of local stability. And so in this species we had, uh, it was chaotic, so it had a positive LE. It showed periods of locally stable and unstable values. And then the local stability showed a very strong seasonality. So it had a dominant uh, period of 12 months. So it's an annual, annual seasonality. Uh, this other time series also had periods of um, locally, unstable, locally stable and unstable values and it was strongly seasonal. But in this case, this series was not chaotic. Or you can have, in some cases, we have series like this one, which were not chaotic. They were always locally stable and they showed no seasonality. So if we summarize this across all of the time series, this plot here is showing in the, in the horizontal direction is the proportion of series that were chaotic, that were not chaotic, but with local instability and that were not chaotic and always stable. And then in the vertical direction is whether not or the proportion of time series that showed seasonality and local stability. So they showed a 
dominant annual periodicity or, or not within each category. And so we can see that seasonal oscillations in local stability are pretty common in chaotic series, but they're also seen in non-chaotic but locally unstable series. Uh, another interesting finding was that we detected chaos less frequently with increasing taxonomic aggregations. So these are similar plots for the functional group and trophic level series. And the proportion of or percentage of series that were classified as chaotic declined as taxonomic aggregation increased. So to try to understand why this, why we're seeing this pattern, we note that when we aggregate data, the abundance fluctuations become less variable. So this is plots of the CV for abundance by taxonomic resolution and the lines connect points from the same or points which are the averages from the same site. Uh, but at the same time, predictability of those time series increases on average with uh, increasing data aggregation. So this is the R squared for abundance. And so if species were just fluctuating independently, we would expect variability to go down sort of definitionally, but we wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily expect predictability to increase. And so the fact that it does kind of suggest that species are fluctuating out of phase due to some kinds of actual dynamics like complementarity and, and that aggregation is smoothing over those dynamics. We also found that local stability, in this case expressed by the this quantity, the variance expansion ratio, which is less conservative than the eigenvalue in terms of local stability, was related to step head, head predictability as measured by the residuals. It's not super obvious in this plot because there's a lot of points, but there, there is a relationship there. Um, and given that uh, local stability seems to vary on a seasonal basis, it suggests that there may be periods of higher and lower forecastability throughout the year. Uh, interestingly, this was seen primarily at the species level, not so much at the functional group and trophic level, which also showed less variation in local stability measures. Uh, and then finally, looking at across site patterns in local stability, uh, we found that sites that had a lower mean temperature, so in other words, sites with higher latitude, possibly higher seasonality and photo period, had higher relative seasonality in the local eigenvalues, and they also tended to have higher LEs. So this was most actually only seen mostly at the coarser levels of taxonomic resolution, although this could possibly be because we didn't have any species level time series at higher mean temperatures. All right, so conclusions and takeaway. So I guess if you remember nothing else from this talk, it's that ecosystems are not 1D and uh, uh, we should be wary of 1D population models, which can mischaracterize dynamics by treating complexity as noise. And to quote Bob May, 1D models do great violence to reality. Uh, also that chaos is not rare, at least not so rare as to be ignorable, particularly for short-lived species. We should note that birds and mammals, which are the least chaotic taxa, were over half of the time series we analyzed in the GPDD, but they're less than 1% of species on Earth. So all told, chaos may be quite considerably more common than one in three. Also, local stability can vary over time, both for chaotic and non-chaotic time series. And there are a variety of implications for management, particularly for short-lived species. So on, on the positive side, short-term forecasting may be feasible, uh, or short-term forecasting of seemingly unpredictable dynamics may be feasible if we use the right methods, but precise long-term prediction may not be possible. However, prediction may be more feasible for taxonomic aggregates than for species level time series. Also, uh, prediction accuracy, sensitivity to change and management efficacy may be greater at certain times of years than others because of seasonal fluctuations in local stability. And so this kind of invites us to rethink our use of linear statistical models, 1D population models and steady state management policies and ask if is this, is this really the best we can do? And perhaps in cases where equilibrium doesn't exist, we should avoid defining objectives in terms of equilibrium conditions and consider more of an index-based approach to management. And so 
to summarize, we kind of see this as an opportunity to use the increasing amounts of data and modern algorithms to better characterize and understand the complex non-equilibrium and higher dimensional dynamics that we see in ecology. So I want to thank the many collectors and sources of long-term data without who or without which studies like these wouldn't be possible, uh, as well as our reviewers and our funders. Here's a list of some of the publications we mentioned. And thanks, thanks for your attention. So I'll open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, that's a great talk and definitely lots of interest to theoreticians. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, the easiest way to do it is if you could raise your hand in the chat. So it's just the reactions bottom, uh, reactions button down at the bottom. Um, and just click raise hand and we can call on people. Um, so Giza, you're first up. Yes, thank you for the uh, lecture. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily understood everything, but uh, you are saying that uh, this uh, uh, dynamics can I be described by one dimensional chaos but may, maybe it is a, a higher dimensional chaos. But uh, my guess would be that uh, if you measure only a single dimension, the abundance of the population, and when it is, uh, has a, a chaotic a multidimensional uh, uh, chaos uh, 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 on the background, I, I would guess you just uh, lose the uh, detectability of the uh, chaos. Is it not true? Oh, so you're asking, like, if you're, if you're only measuring the abundance of one species, how can you actually get at the fact that there's yeah. multi-dimensional chaos? So the way we get around that is through using time delay embedding. So that's Kagan's theorem. So we use time lags of the one species, of one variable that we have measured as substitutes for the unobserved dimensions. And if you use enough, this is why you need a sufficiently long time series in order to okay. do this. So that that's how we how we deal with that. Okay, and it uh, I think it's more uh, a, a general question uh, is the background uh, uh, processes if you have a, a non chaotic population dynamics, uh, uh, but is it is disturbed by some uh, uh, fluctuating weather, but the weather itself chaotic, then you uh, whether you uh, measure a chaotic process or a noisy process. Yeah, so if you have uh, uh, dynamics that are influenced by a chaotic driver, then they're, I guess, by the attractor reconstruction, they're really part of one system. So if you reconstruct it with abundance, it will show up as chaotic because it's, it includes the chaotic driver as part of that system. If you actually wanted to sort of identify the cause of the chaos, like is it because of population dynamics or a driver, you would need well, you need data on the driver or some sort of additional information. So just using the delay reconstruction won't, it'll tell you the system's chaotic, but it won't really tell you why. So that is something for future future work to explore. Okay. So finding these other variables, uh, this is a difficult uh, thing, I guess. Yeah, I guess that that's tricky in, in any ecological study to find what the drivers are, so. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Giza. Uh, Bob? Yeah, so I, Dr. Rogers, that was really a great talk, really, really fascinating. And I, I'm sure Bob may would would have been delighted to hear, hear it had, were he still alive. Uh, I, I had actually uh, the same thought that Giza did about, uh, you know, kind of the causal drivers of the system. And I was thinking uh, that if you think about uh, temperature as, you know, climate is weather is a variable. And, it, and we know that weather dynamics have a chaotic, I mean, Lorenz, well, Lorenz's model show that there's a chaotic element to the weather. That's why it was, it's hard to predict. Um, you would expect that to be more pronounced in short-lived, small-bodied, and ectothermic organisms, which is exactly what you showed, okay, with the empirical patterns where mammals and birds, which are bigger than zooplankton and phytoplankton and are endotherms, uh, tend to be less, less chaotic. 
And also, I was just thinking kind of, you know, the, the issue of causal analysis here. One is whether and this is more of a technical point. And I don't do this kind of time series stuff myself. But when you look at noise, if you if you can, if you looked at uh, noise is positively autocorrelated, because then it could still be noisy. There could still be but there'd be short term predictability, but not long term predictability, even in a purely noisy world. And I wonder if your your time series analyses uh, take take into account uh, autocorrelation in uh, um, sto stochastic drivers. And the, the final thought was, you know, the, the role of seasonality. Uh, I, I know in, in some models, you can actually create chaos if you have, say, a population that's got periodic oscillations which isn't chaotic, and then it, you couple it to another oscillator out there that also is not chaotic, unlike the weather, but the, the net effect could be chaotic. Okay, so that, that's, again, shading more into the causal analysis realm. So great talk. Uh, those are just some questions that occurred to me. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as far as the autocorrelation issue, so some of our our uh simulated time series that we use for testing purposes that included autoregressive models mm -hmm. uh, there was like an ar1 and ar2 and if like a seasonally forced ar there were a few different models with uh, with autocorrelation in them and so in that case we were able to test whether the methods can differentiate between that and actual chaos and we found generally that they could so that was something that we had thought of uh yeah, and then the the shorter lived species being affected more by the environment. That's yeah, is kind of one of our ideas for why you see that pattern with mass and generation time. And I think Steve has done some simulations where you can vary kind of the generation time of the organism and have it driven by a chaotic environment, and then you use the time series to reconstruct um, the layoff and effects one, and that's kind of exactly what you find. So that that's pretty cool. Um, and I forget what the third question is, but, um, but thank you for, thanks for your thoughts. No, the third question just had to do with what, what if you have, you could have drivers that are variable, but not chaotic, but you could, you, chaos could emerge from the interaction between the oh, species right. you're looking at and external, typically fluctuating drivers. That, that was the third point. Yeah. Yeah. So there are definitely, uh, I know there's models where people have shown you have, you know, a non-chaotic system, but they'll be just force it by something and it can create, um, a uh, system with chaotic behavior. And so I think probably similar things do happen out in nature. I, and I'm trying to figure out, and this whole idea like, well, maybe the deterministic skeleton isn't chaotic, but what you actually see, what what you actually see in nature, it doesn't really matter what the deterministic skeleton is, like there's what you have <laughs> in reality. And so I guess the question is, do, are those dynamics, do they have a positive LE or not? And regardless of what, you know, the, the actual driver is. Um, I guess that's what matters in terms of prediction, in terms of, I guess, inference uh, that is going to require a little more digging to, to try and partition those. Mm. Yeah, it's it's an interesting, interesting thought. Thanks. Um, Nadav? Hello. Again, thanks for the great talk. And uh, as an outsider, I would like to understand what, I mean, you always, uh, you, you remind uh, predictability as the main feature, one of the main features of chaotic systems that we cannot predict their behavior. But I was thinking that ecologists are more interested in the chance of extinction, things like that. And this does not have to do with the chaotic dynamic per se, but with the width or the size of the attractor, whether or not the attractor takes, whether or not the chaotic dynamics takes the system to the brink of extinction. Because if the chaotic dynamics of, I don't know, is have an attractor which is between 1,000 and 2,000 individuals, then it is as stable as, a, as an equilibrium state. So, I mean, in, in what, can you explain, in, I mean, to me, in what sense the, the question of a chaotic dynamics is, um, uh, is relevant to the question of extinction, if any? Yeah, so I know, I feel like Steve should answer this question because he's been thinking about this a lot. Um, but I think there's this idea that if you just assume that things are equilibrium or that there isn't sort of any internal dynamics to 
the population that this can sometimes overestimate the risk of extinction because you do things are just, just going to kind of keep going down in a trend and not actually cycle back upwards because they do go through population cycles. And so you kind of have to think about that when we're trying to estimate extinction risk. Um, I mean, at the same time, you could look at when they are when they do kind of go to a low point, they'll how close are they getting? And a lot of the plankton cases, they do the time series does go to zero, but that's not necessarily because there are zero plankton there. It's just because they've all gone into a dormant state or they're at really low abundance and you can't sample them. But then you know they come back every year. So is it you know things you have to kind of think about when we're thinking about extinction risk. I don't know if Steve has any more thoughts on that. Because when I read your paper, which was quite a few months ago, you mentioned that you have analyzed only long time series. And I was wondering if there is an importance in analyzing short time series in order to see extinctions caused by chaotic dynamics. Although it will be much uh, harder to identify the chaotic dynamics in such a case. Yeah, short time series are problematic, especially for some of the longer lived organisms. You just don't have enough recurrences yeah. to really reconstruct mm -hmm. the dynamics very well. And so that's why they often show up as not chaotic, maybe just because there's not enough data. Um, yeah, so not, not really sure what to do there. Okay. Steve, Thank you. you want to say something? <laughs> well, I, I just turned on to say that I was going to say more or less what Tanya was going to say. So great job. <laughs> Um, Axel, you're up next, or did, did you just want to do the chat? No, 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 I did. The, I, did yeah, I want to refer to the chat. Um, I love to talk, and I want to come to Tanya's defense and say, no, it's not external drivers. It can also be totally internally generated. Um, and then, yeah, in the chat, I put an image of, of a full web simulation and um, where, where you have lots of chaotic oscillations of phytoplankton in the food web. Um, then my understanding is that that you get this from from yes from lots of coupled predator prey cycles that then if you take couple if you couple lots of them eventually everything becomes chaotic. But I did never with the, this, I have to confess we never looked into this because the the simulation time is too long. So we always went into the parameter range where the oscillations disappear. This would be worse maybe going back to that. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of theory studies out there. A lot of them, well, it's an, they either conclude chaos exists or doesn't exist, depending on whether or not it occurs in a particular model. But there's also a few cases where, uh, particularly when for some more applied purposes, they're like, construct the model, find that it like is chaotic, and then they intentionally stabilize it to make it easier to work with or because they think chaos can't happen. But maybe that's a mistake and we should be maybe not enforcing stability on things because we think they're stable. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, I think you're next. Sorry, you said my name, Sylvia? Okay. Oh, no. I, I, I can't be, I see, go ahead. Excuse me. Is it my turn? Um, I think it was going to be Stephen, but I... I, I no, think I... sorry, sorry. No, go ahead, Sylvia, go on, go ahead, please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wasn't sure whether you said the Stephen or Stephen. I didn't hear. That's my fault. Please okay. go ahead. Right. Okay. So thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, I was wondering whether, based on the parameters you estimate, uh, you can uh, uh, extrapolate uh, what is uh, the size of the uh, of the parameter space where you expect to see chaos. Uh, I mean that uh, in, in many models, uh, many counting models uh, actually display chaos uh, in a relatively small uh, area of the parameter space. So, also, yeah. Oh well, our models are non-parametric, so there there's no parameters. <laughs> um, so that would be difficult to do. Yeah, but so, yeah, there's there's no way you can somehow measure this. So the sort of uh, the the structural stability of the chaos uh, you are uh, you are detecting um i don't know i don't know okay well 
I mean, you, might, you, might feel, you have uh, sort of an empirically reconstructed function. So you have Jacobians in every time point. And if there's analysis you can do on those to get at that question, then I think that could be doable. But there's no actual like model that exists independently of the data in this case. Maybe yeah, I guess it's more a question for 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 theorists, uh, but yeah. I think it would be an interesting question, you know, whether, yeah, it, it's not, yeah, anyway, right, thanks a lot, <laughs> sorry. Um, Stephen? Okay, well, um, I wanted to jump in with some comments on this external drivers question um, that some people were um, talking about earlier. Uh, my experience is at this point about, you know, 93 years old or something like that. Because, um, you know, our, we did our analyses using, using other methods, but it might be relevant. Um, if you reconstruct with just a few lags, then you don't pick up high dimensional chaos. So if it's like being driven by the weather, which is high dimensional chaos, you're not going to pick that up. Um, but at least that's 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 what we found. Um, but you might pick up that something's being driven by another species in the food web that's chaotic. So um, the, if you've got a few tightly interacting species and the one you're measuring is just being driven by chaos in some other part of the food web, which is low dimensional, that might ring up as that species being chaotic. So that's, I think that's our sort of both confirmation and argument against the idea that a lot of these are um, chaos due to um, being driven by something that's externally chaotic. Um, and the other comment is that the, the, the Beninsa et al analysis um, looked like an example of what Bob Holt was suggesting. Um, of chaos resulting from interaction with a sort of an autocorrelated external driver. Um, in that case, um, weather fluctuations um, that were largely seasonal rather than, than high dimensional chaos. So how many lags were you using, Tanya, typically? Uh, we used up to six. Up to six, okay. Yeah. So possibly they might have been picking up some fairly high dimensional um, external drivers. Yeah, it depended a little bit on the time series length. So in the case of the, it was only 30, we, we didn't use up to six. <laughs> it was only 30 time points. Yeah. So it varied a little bit, but um, yeah, for the longer ones, we yeah. just tried up to six. So Okay, thanks. Thank you. I think this is now the is it University of Florida graduate assistants. I'm sure that's a group. But <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not using no, my normal no. account. Um, I thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. I have a couple questions. One is, so uh, I also uh, am pretty convinced that using one dimensional models is probably not the best way to test whether there's chaos in a, in a time series. But um, what about, you, you had mentioned the flower beetle group. Um, what they did is like they fit the LPA model, which is three dimensional. It covers all the population types the uh, parameters have like biologically meaningful, uh, are by, are, they are biologically meaningful. Um, and they are also, you know, they would calculate the Jacobian um, from that fitted model, right? Um, so how would you compare um, this method compared to that? And, and also, um, you had also mentioned about like um, kind of management implications and one of the um, kind of, one of the, common uses of like dynamical models is like you know, calculating an invasion criterion um, and stability is, is often useful there because it gives you an analytical solution. So has anyone ever looked at what like an invasion criteria would be in a chaotic system? Um, so yeah, those are my two questions. Thank you. Uh, sure, so the LPA model, so that is one of the cases where uh, they have a very, very detailed understanding of how the system works and are able to empirically measure most many of the parameters. And the results from the model match the empirical time series extremely well. So basically the like model is the data. And so it's a really, if that is the case, 
that it's excellent for you. And you can do a lot of analyses with that, with that model. Uh, for any odd time series from the field, though, we don't really have that detailed knowledge of the system. Some of the, ex the field and experimental studies that I've listed, um, uh, they're a little more well studied and they have a pretty good understanding of how they work. And in some cases, they're able to develop a parametric model for them. Uh, but in most of the cases, we can't do that. So we have to, the best we can as a substitute is to sort of reconstruct the dynamics with non-parametric methods and delay bidding to the best extent that we can. And that doesn't really give you the, there's no parameters there. You can't really get a detailed understanding of how it works, but it can give you some quantification of just in general, how the properties of the dynamics, what sort of properties of the dynamics there are in that system. So I guess that's the difference there. Um, and yes, for management and, Wait, remind me, what was, the, what was the second question? It was more about like invasion criteria. Like what would okay. be, an, like how would you calculate that in a chaotic system? Yeah, that one gets kind of tricky. So the there's an interesting modeling study which used a, uh, it was a chaotic plankton model. And Steve was actually trying to recreate the results from that. And it turns out if you um, start the system with all like 11 species in it that you end up with like only three and all the other ones go extinct but if you start with like six of them and then like kind of let them reach their attractor and then sort of like add other species in you can get like all of the species to coexist with each other so this kind of the invasion criteria sort of depends on it actually being in a chaotic state and then when the timing seems to kind of matter in terms of when things can invade or not. I think because of, you know, there being different uses of resources at different times and different periods of the attractor. So uh, it gets a little more complicated. I don't, don't know how much people looked into this, but it's an interesting, interesting sort of question. And there's generally a theory that shows that in chaotic systems, you could have more species coexisting than in say more of, of a stable stable state. So it's one of the proposed sort of paradox of the plankton solutions. Uh, but yeah, it's that's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Hi, yeah, thank you for the talk. I was curious, um, I believe in your original paper, right, you had the baseline of 30, um, right, uh, Third, the length of 30 for your time series. And then I believe you also referenced in the original paper, like if you moved it up to 50, you got like 40% and then like 70 or something like that was like 50% were chaotic. I was curious if you ran any of those analyses like in relation to taxonomic group on those like longer time series, because you were kind of talking about like the problem with mammals and this idea of recurrence, like sometimes if you have a short time series, it's hard to pick up, you know, the proportion of that are actually chaotic. I was curious if you extended any of those into those longer time series analyses. Uh, we did not rerun the proportions for the longer time series. I think just because a lot of, anyway, it kind of screwed up the representation of the different groups. So like a lot of the mammal ones were on the shorter side. I think all the plankton ones were at least a hundred. So um, it didn't really change anything there. Um, and it could have just been because when you constrain to longer time series, it's just sort of chopping off a bunch of the birds and mammals. And so the percentage goes up. So it was kind of hard to draw conclusions from that, but um, we did do analysis where we kind of artificially truncated the series to shorter lengths to see how that affected things. and. Uh, that does kind of cause things that work out to get turned into things that were not chaotic. Um, but yeah, if we could, it would be interesting to find some longer mammal time series that we could test that on. Okay, thank you. I think that seems to have brought us to the end of people with their hands up. I'm almost precisely at the hour. Oh, no, oh hang on, Axel. Ah, there's always one more. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, um, you said, like, if it's um, 
chaotic that people look, shouldn't look for stable equilibria. But um, in some sense, and I did mathematics, mathematicians will tell me if I'm wrong or not. There is usually, if there is a chaotic attractor, there's also an equilibrium somewhere around which everything flies. And so it makes still sense to, 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 to see if there is an equilibrium or not. Well, that, sure. Whether you ever get there is another question. <laughs> so. Get there. They, they fly around it. They fly around it. But 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 the the the, the fact that they're flying around requires that they're somewhere in the middle is an equilibrium. Actually, there's a bunch of new stuff on hidden attractors that are not uh, are surrounding a, a fixed point. So, um, and and they they tend to be in, in systems that have strong bounding. Um, but yeah. Anyway, I, I've never found an ecological model that does that but yeah there's there's a bunch of examples where you can have a hidden attractor all right that's that's all i'm going to say for today <laughs> steve really wants to find one <laughs> <laughs> that seems a, a challenge to set for people then sounds fun sounds amazing um <laughs> if there are, are no further questions from anyone um no so well Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tanya, for speaking up, asking the que oh, questions, and it's, it's a fantastic talk. Um, as I say, our next one of these will be in uh, two weeks' time, and we have uh, Eliza Tibold from Paris is going to be talking to us about um, niche clustering and um, how that emerged from competition and predation. So uh, do join us then. Thank you very much. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.